In the previous 11-minute lecture, we studied how Brayton cycles consist of compressed cold and fresh air being mixed with fuel and combusting them to utilize that energy in the form of high pressure and high temperature to generate work at a turbine. And since this is an open system, which is harder to analyze than closed systems, we discussed how the hot air that is exhausted from the turbine can be assumed to pass through a heat exchanger and lose heat to come into the compressor as cold and fresh air. This, together with a heat exchanger device where heat is added, instead of a combustion stage, allows us to simplify the typical Brayton cycle to a closed system cycle. If you haven't watched that 11-minute lecture yet, I advise you to do so before watching this lecture. In that video, we briefly discussed how intercooling, reheating, and regeneration could help bring up the usually poor efficiency of Brayton cycles. You can check the three-minute example videos of that lecture where we calculate some efficiency values if you haven't already. The links are down below. In the main lecture video, we briefly touched on the first of these three devices, the regenerators. We pointed out that the temperature after the turbine at 4 is still hotter than the relatively cool compressed air at 2. And since we want to heat the air at the heat exchanger, it makes sense to sort of preheat the air right before the heat exchanger with the hot air that is already coming out of the turbine. That way, the required heat in at the heat exchanger is less, and since the efficiency of the cycle will depend on that heat, the efficiency can therefore be higher. This is what the regenerator does. Takes heat from 4 and transfers as much as it can to 2 so that Qn is not as high as it would have needed to be. As you can probably already tell, a regenerator is nothing more than just a heat exchanger. The regenerator brings in the hot gases from 4 and the cooler gases from 2 and allows them to exchange heat. This Q region goes from 4 to 2. The now warmer gases are at state 5 and the cooler exhaust gases are at state 6. And again, since neither the work in or the work out changed, meaning that the net work out didn't change, but we did in fact reduce the necessary Q in, the efficiency effectively increases. This change in a TS diagram would look like this. We still have the two constant pressure lines we had before, and the processes from 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 haven't changed. It just happens that there are now some intermediate steps. State 5 after state 2 and state 6 after state 4. The regenerator's heat Q region is moving from between 6 and 4 to between 2 and 5. Notice that you cannot have 5 at a higher temperature than 4, but we do want to come as close as possible to minimize the necessary Q in. Because of this concept, we care about what we call the regenerator effectiveness. This effectiveness is related to the heat or energy that the gases at 2 gain and is therefore defined as the actual specific enthalpy change over the maximum possible specific enthalpy change. The actual change is from 2 to 5 or H5 minus H2 and the max would be from 2 to 4 or H4 minus H2 in the best case scenario. It's worth pointing out here that the reversibility of the process or the regenerator being adiabatic has nothing to do with the effectiveness. The regenerator is still assumed to be adiabatic and the typical energy conservation equation for a heat exchanger can be used. The heat lost by the exhaust gases, H4 minus H6, is equal to the heat gained by the compressed air, H5 minus H2. Now, if the regenerator effectiveness is high, which is usually the case, then 5 and 4 are pretty close. This is important to know because you could assume that the specific heat Cp for both numerator and denominator are going to be similar. And therefore, an approximation of this effectiveness reduces to T5 minus T2 over T4 minus T2. The second device that can help make this cycle more efficient is an intercooler. Intercooling is the process of combining compression with cooling. When we first studied isentropic processes, we pointed out that isentropic processes will not minimize the work input. During the reversible processes 12-minute lecture, link below, we talked about how the most efficient type of heat transfer is isothermal heat transfer. And it's just the same idea here. We can remove heat while compressing to have an isothermal process. In reality, what we actually do is compress, remove heat, compress, remove heat, etc. 
The more intercoolers you use, the higher the efficiency, but at some point, the increase in efficiency is not worth the extra complexity of the system. So a typical arrangement includes two of these intercoolers, which will improve overall efficiency enough. On a PV diagram, we can draw an adiabatic compression process from state 1 to 2. Remember that the specific work required for this process is minus the integral of VDP, which means the area left of the curve. What we're used to seeing is that an isothermal line would have a more gentle slope. This would be the process if we cooled while compressing, and it is indeed showing us a smaller quantity of specific work required between 1 and 2 prime. However, in reality, since how we're achieving this is by using a regular adiabatic and hopefully reversible and therefore isentropic compressor from 1 to A, then stopping and letting the heat exchanger that we call intercooler reject some heat between A to B, and then compressing a bit more from B to 2 prime, what we would see in the PV diagram is 1 to A on the same 1 to 2 line, then the intercooler lets heat out at a constant pressure, meaning a horizontal line as the temperature drops, and then another isentropic process between B and 2 prime. If we go back to the TS diagram that we were using to describe Braden cycles, notice that we need three constant pressure lines now, not just two like we did before. From 1 to A, we have an isentropic compression to the pressure at the inner cooler. From A to B, we stay on the same pressure line, and usually, although not necessarily, we try to drop to the same temperature we had at 1, and then we compress isentropically once more to state 2 prime. And again, usually but not necessarily to a temperature equal to the temperature at A. With this, of course, you can probably already see that what a reheater would do, the last of today's three devices, is achieve the same effects of trying to compress at constant temperature, but at the turbine, by trying to expand at constant temperature by adding heat intermediately. Our schematic would show state 3 passing through a turbine to state C, a heat exchanger that we happen to call reheater from C to D, which adds heat at a constant pressure, and then we would see a second turbine from D to 4 prime. The TS diagram would be similar to what we just saw with the intercooler. We would see three pressures, a downward vertical expansion from 3 to C, heat bringing up the temperature at constant pressure from C to D, and another vertical expansion from D to 4 prime. Now, you might be wondering why in our TS diagrams only, neither 1 and 2 before, nor 3 and 4 here, are the same temperature, since we wanted to make these processes isothermal. Why do we usually make 1 and B, 2 and A, 3 and D, and 4 and C have the same temperature instead of 1 and 2 or 3 and 4? The reason for this is that intercoolers and reheaters are just meant to increase the overall efficiency of the cycle without adding extra devices that would require work. For example, could we easily drop TV to something lower than T1? Think about that and think what 1 means in the real open system. Even though these TS diagrams don't match the PV diagrams here, the PV diagrams process is the theoretical goal, but more often than not, in practice, we go for what the TS diagrams are showing. The short answer is that it's more complex than just trying to achieve the optimal isothermal heat transfer. If we draw a TS diagram for a Braden cycle with a regenerator, an intercooler, and a reheater, we would of course see the compression with the intercooling at the bottom left, the expansion with the reheater at the top right, and due to the regeneration, the intermediate steps 5 and 6 between the compressors and the turbines. As you can probably tell, there are many expressions that we could list here. However, we've seen them all before for the different types of processes we've studied so far, so let's instead look at an example where we use part of what we've learned today, specifically the regeneration part only, and in the additional video examples linked below, we'll get to use all of what we learned here for different scenarios, including intercoolers and reheaters. An ideal Braden cycle uses an ideal regenerator, which means that the temperature after the regenerator is the same as the exit temperature after the turbine. If air enters the compressor at 15 psi and 540 Rankine, the pressure ratio is 9, and the maximum seen temperature is 2200 Rankine, 
What is the thermal efficiency of this cycle assuming constant specific heats? What would the efficiency be without the regenerator? Pause here and try solving this problem yourself before watching the solution. The overall efficiency of the cycle is the net work out over the heat in. Since we don't have mass flow rate information, we can just write this in terms of specific energy. The net work out is the difference between heat in and out, and we can rearrange this as 1 minus the out to in ratio. If we draw a quick TS diagram and label the states in order, with state 1 being the air before the compressor, we see that the ideal regenerator makes states 3 and 5 have the same temperature. The highest temperature would be that of state 4 right before the turbine. Since Q23 is equal to Q65, because it's the heat exchange at the regenerator Q region, Q in would be the heat between 3 and 4, and Q out would be the heat between 6 and 1. In other words, Q out is H6 minus H1, and Q in is H4 minus H3. And since the problem asks specifically to use constant specific heats, we can write these specific enthalpies in terms of a constant CP value. Therefore, the efficiency expression reduces to temperature values. The value for T4 we have, because it's the maximum temperature of the cycle, and T1 is the temperature before the compressor, also given. Since the region heat is the same between 5 and 6 and 2 and 3, and T5 equals T3 for this ideal regenerator, it means that T6 is equal to T2. This is important because for our efficiency expression, we can substitute T6 for T2 and T3 for T5. We weren't given T2 and T5, but because we know that both the compressor and the turbine are part of an ideal Braden cycle and therefore isentropic, we can use the isentropic relationships between temperatures, what we want to find, and pressures, what we were given, to solve for T2 and T5. With these, we see that we need to look up the specific heat ratio K for air, substituted, substitute the temperatures we have, and the pressure ratio to find T2 and T5. We substitute these in our efficiency expression, and we find an efficiency of 54%. If we now try to see what the efficiency would be without the regenerator, meaning that there is no state 3 nor 6, Q out would be T5 minus T1, and Q in would be T4 minus T2. The temperature values themselves wouldn't have changed, so we just substitute the values, and we get the efficiency without the regenerator. In this specific case, the difference between efficiency values is not much, but it's still an improvement that required no additional external input, so it's still a win. For more complex problems with regeneration, and others with intercoolers and reheaters, make sure to check out the links in the video description. You will also find links to the other lectures of the thermal course, as well as the playlists of other engineering courses. Thanks for watching.